So tonight we're back in the book of Acts, and you can turn to Acts chapter 18. And I want to I speak to you tonight about something I think is very, very important uh, for the church to embrace, and of course, we, we are the church. And I, and I speak often about the condition of, of the church. God's church in the West is, is stumbling and, and struggling, and God has a deep, deep love for His people. He loves the local church. He loves the people that comprise it. And He wants them to succeed. He wants them to walk in victory. He wants them to walk closely with Him and experience His goodness and His closeness and His presence and His plans for their lives. I remember a good friend uh, who has since passed, his name was Rich Fagley, and we would spend some time together, and he would lament, he would, he would share with me, he was a Sunday school teacher, and he would share with me that the, the, one of the biggest problems he saw in the church today is that the, the church didn't have the kind of biblical depth that it once had. They didn't know their Bibles. People don't seek God in the Bible so the church is becoming shallow and, and maybe looking for experiences or entertainment or, or whatever it might be, some, some quick comfort. But, but really, God has given us something rich and meaningful and powerful and satisfying, and His people aren't taking advantage of it the way that God wants them to. There's an expectation, I believe, that Jesus has as our King, that when you line up before Him and you follow Him and you pledge your life to Him and He captures your heart... His word now takes a special place in your life because Jesus himself is the word made flesh. But we still have God's written word, which is a, a very precious and powerful gift made available to us. It unlocks uh, the, 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 the promises of heaven. It guides us to make wise decisions in our lives, and it shows us glimpses of our Father's heart, among many other things, giving us deep understanding of uh, the journey that we've been called to. And, and without it, there's going to be a shallowness to God's people's lives that isn't meant to be there. Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, that we are not meant to live by bread alone, but by the very word of God. It's meant to transform us. It's meant to take deep root. It's called living and active. And, and we all know, we would all say as God's people, yes, the word of God is, is very important. And yet I would say a common struggle that we could all relate with is sometimes we're not giving the word of God the place that it deserves in our lives, the time that it deserves. And it can become a struggle. Now, everybody relax because I'm not going to lay a big old thick guilt trip on you tonight to, you need to read your Bibles more. That's not where we're going. But I, I do want to acknowledge as we enter into a specific story within the book of Acts that really focuses on the Word of God, I want to acknowledge that this is one of our weak points. And this is something that I pray over this church family that we would not be found wanting here, that we would experience the richness of God that is to be found in His Word. But if we're going to do that, we have to approach things a little bit differently than the church at large does right now. We have to give this a priority in our life, and if it's going to be a priority in our lives, we have to understand its significance. I don't think it works to just go through the shoulds and oughts and try to give it a priority in our life that way, then it can just become some religious ritual. The Word of God, if approached the wrong way, can actually be of no use at all. You can take the Pharisees, for example. They were champions of the Word of God, and Jesus was not at all impressed with their hearts. So it's the approach, how we come to the Word of God, and what our understanding is of it that I think can really begin to shape and impact our hearts as we handle it. I can even give testimony in my own life. There was a time where I approached the Word of God completely out of guilt. I should be doing this more. I ought to be doing this more. And I would open out of sheer determination the book when I was really busy, and I would read my three chapters, and I would put the check in the box, and I did my reading for the day. Whew. And yet I don't think God was too impressed with that. And I did that for years. I did that for a long time. 
It was just something on my to-do list. I had to get through it. And if I didn't get through it, you know, that, those were the days that I would be looking for something bad to happen. I didn't read my Bible, so I hope I don't get a flat tire today or, you know, something like that. You know, God's going to be mad at me. That I, I, it doesn't, it, it's not this guilt-ridden process. It is this treasure, this gift that has been left for us to enjoy, should we choose to enjoy it. And I want you to approach it that way. Because if you approach it out of, boy, pastor really laid it on us tonight. He's right. I really do got to get in the word more. Okay, let's really try this. And if it's a guilt thing, I'll give you to Wednesday before you're tapping out and you're back to how it was, right? But if God would open our eyes and give us a taste of what it's meant to be, this blessing, this gift, this, this source of uh, a, a rich and powerful view of the heart of God that begins to commune with us. The word of God is called active and living because God can truly speak to our hearts in a powerful way through his word. But we have to come to the point where we learn how to listen to God and learn how to seek God in his word. So all this to say, I believe that when we answer the call that Jesus gives us in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. When we answer that radical call, he has an expectation that we are going to be a people of the word of God as we follow the word made flesh. It's going to take a special place in our hearts. So I'm going to be talking to you in, about a man named Apollos, who is mighty in the word. I love that. I think that's how the King James puts it, and I absolutely love that title. How, wouldn't that be awesome if from the Holy Spirit's point of view, you were labeled as someone who was mighty in the word? Man, I, I, yeah, well, I want to get there. I want to follow after that, and, and there's so much. All of us are on that journey, and we have that opportunity. So we're going to take note of the uh, uh, man named Apollos tonight. So by very quick review, we've already, we're getting ready to go into the third journey, the third missionary journey of Paul. The first journey, we, we were there in Acts 13 and 14. This is where Paul went to Galatia, the, the first Roman province. And, and in Galatia, uh, he, he was in Lystra and Derby and Iconium, Pisidian, Antioch. He's planting churches there. People are coming to know Christ. So he's got these little baby congregations all over. And several times through the book of Acts, he's going back there because he's not just an evangelist. Uh, he's a disciple maker. He's going back. How are you guys doing? Let's correct this area. Let's grow deeply. And he wants healthy churches, deep disciples and healthy churches beyond just straight evangelism for the apostle Paul makes him a, a powerhouse in the kingdom of God. So he's actually going, you're going to see in the text, he's going back there in verse 23 to check in on those ch young churches in Galatians, in the, in the province of Galatia. And of course, that's where we get our first book, the book of Galatians that Paul wrote was the very first epistle that he wrote. And they, it was circulated through those little churches. And then the second missionary journey uh, was back in Acts 15, 16, 17, 18, uh, c coming through those chapters, and that was his call to Macedonia, uh, also to Achaia, kind of northern Greece and southern Greece, and, and he planted churches in Philippi and Thessalonica, Athens, Berea, Corinth, some of the churches we're quite familiar with. And out of that trip, he wrote to first he wrote First and Second Thessalonians as he's writing and instructing the Thessalonians. Whew, I'm getting Thessalonians back in Thessalonica. You guys help me out here if you see I'm struggling. So with that behind him, he is now entering just at the very beginning of his third missionary journey, which is going to primarily focus in Ephesus. But we'll get there. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Tonight, I want to pause as we're setting the stage with this man named Apollo, someone who ended up working alongside Paul. They became co-laborers that we read in the book of Corinthians. So in Acts chapter 18, uh, let me just begin with that introduction in, in verse 23. It says, after spending time in Antioch, Paul went back through Galatia and Phrygia, visiting and strengthening all the believers. This was 
such an important thing that Paul did as he would strengthen those believers uh, that, that he had already planted in those churches. So now we're gonna learn about this man named Apollos, and I'm gonna begin in verse 24, and in verse 24 and 25, you're gonna get this snapshot biography about who Apollos was. It says, meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, an eloquent speaker who knew the scriptures well, had arrived in Ephesus from Alexandria in Egypt. He had been taught the way of the Lord, and he taught others about Jesus with an enthusiastic spirit and with accuracy. However, he knew only about John's baptism. So let's get a snapshot of who this guy was. He's an intriguing guy because he is, first of all, a Jew, born into a family of Jews. He's from Egypt, specifically in Alexandria. That city was built by Alexander the Great, and there was a large establishment now of Jews in, in that uh, city. And it says that he had been taught the way of the Lord. So in this Jewish colony, uh, they estimate maybe around 100,000 Jews were there at this time, someone had introduced him to the teaching of Jesus, and it was connected to John the Baptist. Maybe it was John the Baptist's disciples, maybe it was John the Baptist himself, or someone connected there, but he had been taught about who Jesus was from the perspective of John the Baptist. So then when he learned that Jesus was the Messiah, because that was John the Baptist's perspective, he was looking forward to the Messiah to come. When he saw Jesus, he said, behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. So when, when Apollos gets this instruction, he begins to teach others about Jesus accurately. In other words, he starts using the Old Testament to prove, yeah, Jesus is the Messiah who we were promised, who is coming. So he is, he is powerfully, persuasively, passionately proclaiming Jesus Christ is the Messiah. Apollos is a good guy. He's, he is a great man. But very interestingly, even though all that was the case, he only knew about John's baptism. Apollos had insufficient information. Now, I do believe that Apollos was saved. I do believe he understood enough about Jesus Christ as the Messiah to understand who he was and to receive him to, in, into his life and, and to carry out the ministry as far as proclaiming Christ. But let's talk about the difference. What, if you only know about the baptism of John, what's the difference between the baptism of John and the baptism of Jesus? Like, what, what's, what's missing? And, I, and let me just paint a real simple picture uh, from my best understanding. The baptism of John is going to be pre-Pentecost understanding of Christian theology, looking forward to the promised Messiah. That's what John the Baptist did. That's what he proclaimed. He was making the connection of the Messiah to Jesus. But it's pre-Pentecost. Jesus, as he taught the, the baptism of Jesus, this is a deeper Christian theology, all right? This is, this is going to include the coming of the Holy Spirit. John's baptism was about repentance, very important. Jesus' baptism included the coming of the Holy Spirit, extremely important, but lacking in John's theology. Jesus would have been teaching about the birth of the church, extremely important to know lacking in John the Baptist's theology. And Jesus would have been rich with the teaching of the Great Commission and the making of disciples, the effort to reach the world for the kingdom of God, again, lacking in John's theology. John's theology, John's baptism was that of repentance and water, but Jesus' baptism was a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire and included this more encompassing picture of what is going on. And Apollos was lacking that. So even though he was very passionate about proclaiming Jesus, his, his message was shallow because his understanding was shallow. But God is going to help 
Apollos along. He sends to Apollos a couple named Priscilla and Aquila. They've already been Paul's tutors. Uh, They've come alongside of Paul and ministered to Paul. They have a special relationship with Paul. So now they're going to be ministering to Apollos. Listen in verse 26. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him preaching boldly in the synagogue, they took him aside and explained the way of God even more accurately. So again, I want to emphasize, Apollos didn't have anything wrong. He was proclaiming Jesus, his death, his burial, and his resurrection as the Messiah that God had sent. But as Priscilla and Aquila are listening, they begin to put together his preaching is missing something. There's no mention of the Holy Spirit. There's no mention of God's program to reach the Gentiles. There's there's big missing pieces in his theology. So let's help him get even more accurate. Let's help him hone in on everything that has to do with the new covenant here. And so they take him aside and do this. Now, this is really interesting because Apollos is a man who stands on the word of God. This is the foundation of his ministry. So he is doing two things with the word of God. Number one, he is proclaiming it, everything that he knows and understands, and at the same time, he is receiving it and growing. Now, Apollo sets a great example here because this becomes a stumbling block to many Christians who want to begin to share what they're learning about God. They w- I often hear this, and it's a struggle I've had. Well, I want to share what I know, but I don't... I I don't know enough yet. I don't know the answers to a lot of the questions. So I'm going to continue to study, and when I know a lot more and I can answer people's questions, then I will begin to teach and, and share the things that I am learning in Scripture. Well, it is important that you never stop learning. However, I I don't find the model in Scripture to wait until you have this book all figured out and then begin sharing, to wait until you've got, you can answer all people's questions. Let me tell you what, I am decades away from that position. Uh, I am nowhere close to being able to answer everybody's questions. There's this, there's this freeing phrase that you can use when someone asks you a question you don't know. I don't know, I'll look into that, all right? <laughs> Stick that one in your back pocket and you can get going now and just be honest Don't pretend to be some biblical superstar and that you have all the answers. Just be honest with people. Here's what I've figured out so far, and it's pretty awesome. Let me share it with you. And if they say, well, what about this? That's a great question. I don't know. I'm going to look into that and get back to them. It will press you uh, to become a student of the Bible yourself. Uh, Almost on a weekly basis, I get questions I don't know the answers to. I know the answers to a lot of questions, and there's a lot of questions I still don't know the answers to, and I still have my own questions that I haven't figured out. That's all okay. None of that is a threat to me sharing what I do know, and you can't allow that to be a hindrance in your life. So Apollos is modeling this so well. He's he's proclaiming accurately what he has learned about Jesus, And he is still growing and learning about Jesus as he's doing it. He's not too proud. He's still teachable. I think this is just a marvelous example about what the discipleship process looks like. You should have someone pouring into your life, and you should be pouring into somebody else's life. And both things should be going on on a regular basis. I believe that this is the design. This this should be... Uh, just the, the practice and the standard as uh, we are studying the word of God and growing together in community. So God sends Priscilla and Aquila and this, this blesses Apollos. He learns the way of God according to the Bible even more accurately. So he's growing. So let me turn to verse 27. Apollos had been thinking about going to Achaia, and, and I need to interject here, Corinth is a city in Achaia, so uh, that's where he ended up going. So when you think Achaia, think that a big chunk of that is Corinth. And the brothers and sisters in Ephesus encouraged him to go. They wrote to the believers in Achaia, asking them to welcome him. When he arrived there, he proved to be of great benefit to those who, by God's grace, had believed. So here he's looking to go 
to Achaia. We know he ends up in, in Corinth. And, and something really interesting happens here that I, I want to point out. Because he ends up ministering in Corinth while Paul is ministering in Corinth. Now, Paul got there first. Then Apollos comes in, and while Paul has kind of done his evangelistic sweep through there, Apollos comes in with what he knows about Jesus, and I would, if I had to put the two side by side, from what I read in scripture and the way that people are reacting, this is what I would say. Paul is a powerhouse in his theology and understanding. He may not be the most eloquent speaker, but you can't help but fall in love with him because of his heart for God. And he is so authentic, and he loves God so passionately that wherever he goes, uh, it, it, the sacrifices that he, he makes so that people can know Christ, churches are planted. Paul is the real deal, and people love Paul. Then as Apollos comes through, Apollos is just put together differently, different gifts. So Apollos might not have the depth of understanding that Paul has, but man, can that guy preach. Apollos has a silver tongue, and he uses it for the right purposes. So he is strengthening believers and building on top of the foundation that Paul built, and something intriguing happens. Factions start to form. In Corinth, there's some believers who say, you know, Paul was a great guy, but he couldn't preach like Apollos. So I'm an Apollos guy, and if Apollos is going to be speaking, I'm going to be there. If it's Paul, you know what, I, you guys can just let me know how it was. But then there was another group, another faction that said, you know what, Paul was the first guy to get here. Paul took a beating for us. Paul paid a high price so that our church could be born. You know, Paul came through here. We owe him something. And, you know, I don't know who this silver tongue guy coming in after him is. He didn't do any of that. Paul was our founder, and he is, we're going to remain faithful to him. So if this Apollos guy is coming in and getting big crowds, we don't want any part of that. We are Paul people. So this is what's happening in Corinth. And Paul comes in and he goes, ay, 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 what's the matter with you people? He says, if you want to know who the hero is, it's not Apollos, and it's not Paul. When I came through and planted this church, I'm pretty sure that I said Jesus was the hero. So what are you doing with Apollos and Paul? So let's go. I, I want to actually show you how this plays out a little bit, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, turn there, because I, I want you to hear the instruction of Paul as he's dealing with the people who are not responding very well to Paul and Apollos' ministry together. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. If you're there, say amen. amen. If you're still looking, say oh me. All right, sounds like most of you are there. 1 Corinthians 3 verse 4. Paul says this, when one of you says I am follower, I'm a follower of Paul. And the other says, I follow Apollos. Aren't you acting just like people of the world? After all, who's Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it. But it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seed grow. The one who plants and the one who waters work together with the same purpose, and both will be rewarded for their own hard work. So if I dropped all the way down to verse 21, Paul says, so don't boast about following a particular human leader. I tell you what, it is important, I think, to give thanks to God for faithful Bible preachers and gospel proclaimers that have influenced your life. That's a good thing. But we cannot allow ourselves to get hung up on people, names, personalities like they're the hero we're all servants of God with different gifts 
And as soon as you begin to do that, we're losing sight of who the hero is. We're losing sight of who we're following. So we have to be very careful that we don't become followers of David Jeremiah or followers of Chip Ingram or, or follow, we could, we could throw a hundred names out there. Or followers of John Green. We are followers of Jesus Christ. This is, now this is really, really important. It really is. Because it would, it would break my heart if anybody got to the position that they were listening to my voice instead of Jesus' voice. Do, do you understand? So, so this is what can happen. You know, this is where trouble starts. When you, get to, when you start hanging on to a human personality, when you, when you start getting too stuck to the people that God has given to build his kingdom instead of tying your heart directly to the king. When you tie your heart to the king, you can appreciate his people, but your eyes stay fixed on the king. But if your eyes start to focus on the people and you start to, uh, to get too close and hang on too tightly to one of God's servants, uh, we need to understand God's servants are all extremely flawed. We have to make sure that we hang our hearts and tie our hearts to Jesus Christ alone. That is something that's very, very important to me in this ministry. It's extremely important to me. That hearts are being tied directly to Jesus, not to people. We need to be followers of Jesus. I want this ministry to produce people who are truly followers of Jesus Christ. So Paul was giving instruction to the Corinthians who struggled with this. Well, I like this guy, and I like the way this guy preaches. Well, I like the points this guy makes. Paul says, make sure, and do this check in your own heart. Make sure that it's Jesus that you're chasing after. Make sure that when you come to the Haskell house on a Sunday night, that you're here to hear from the heart of God, whoever might be bringing the message. And make sure that the message is coming from the Word of God because that is what holds the heart of God. This is why the Word of God is so very, very important. So let's get back to our story with Apollos. There's not a whole lot left. So he says uh, in verse 28 is the last verse in this chapter. He refuted the Jews with powerful arguments and public debate. Using the scriptures, he, ex he explained to them that Jesus was the Messiah. Now, you know that the heartbeat of this ministry is to make disciple makers. My prayer over each of you is that as you follow God, not only do you become the, the disciple that he's called you to be, but that you become the kind of follower that produces the fruit of other disciples in your life, that produces the fruit of other people seeking after God because of their time spent with you. That is the influence that you have on people. Apollos was really good at this. So I just wanna take some very simple, basic notes on him. The, the first thing that I noticed, church, is that Apollos was a man of the scriptures. He was, if you want to be an effective disciple maker and an effective disciple at all, you must be a person of the word of God. You can't skip this. You can't do a seven-day fast and then get a, su a Sunday meal and, and become mighty in the word of God and, or, or become mighty in anything in the Lord. This, this is our foundation. This is our source of truth. You can, find, you can find truth potentially outside of the word of God, but the word of God is the test of all truth. Everything you find in here is absolutely true and is necessary for us to be able to grow deeply in God's plan for our life and in our relationship with God. So we must become students of the scriptures. It also tests our heart. You know, it's interesting. When my mother passed away a long time ago, one of the first things that I did is I began to go back through some of our correspondence, emails that we had written, letters that were exchanged, and those became very, very precious to me. They meant something to me because we had a relationship together. <laughs> Rich, when, when Carolyn passed, one of the first things I did is I started reading the texts. 
I, I just read the, the, the exchanges that we had and, and it brought a little bit of comfort. It made me smile. I ended up going back to a little silver box that I had where I had something that Carolyn had written to me and, I, and I, those things became a treasure to me. Jesus has left us his word and he has gone to be with the Father. He has left us his spirit as his gift but we have this treasure that reveals his heart. And if he really is the object of the affection of your heart, that word is gonna be something that is precious to you because it holds his heart. I I think there is an indication that something is, is out of line in your relationship in your heart with the Lord when the word of God gets neglected over extended periods of time, when it holds no interest to you. This has nothing to do with laying guilt on anybody. I think there's just something dinging on our dashboard when we can go week after week after week as the pattern without getting into the word of God. There, something there is saying, I really don't treasure this. I'm really not interested. I have a lot of other busyness, a lot of other affections in my life, but I just can't get to this. I'll, I'll just listen to something on Sunday or on the radio or something like that. I, I would challenge you that as your love for the Lord grows, your hunger for his word will also grow. And understand this, when you pick up the word of God, it's not to become really smart in all the Bible stories. Who cares about that? Understand that the word of God reveals to you glimpses of the Father's heart. And that is a treasure to the followers of Jesus. And that is how we read the word of God. Yes, I understand it's important that we study to show ourselves approved, uh, you know, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. There, there is an element of work that we, we need to understand holistically how the Bible fits together and, and do the hard work to piece that together. But also understand that when you open your, your Bible, the very first prayer that you ought to utter is, Holy Spirit, help me to see the Father's heart as I read from these pages. Make it relational. Don't make it a study in academia so that you're a smarter Bible student. That will produce a Pharisee. But seek the Father's heart when you open the Bible. And I tell you what, God can begin to reveal things to you in very special and meaningful ways. There are verses, as I began to to seek the scriptures in this way, that just grabbed a hold of my heart and I knew God was giving me something that I was going to need So it's very, very important that as we become a student of the scriptures, that what we're actually becoming a student of is the heart of God. Do that, and it will be a joy to open your Bibles and seek God. But make it a study in academia where you're going to become a student of the Bible, and you may end up producing a Pharisee. And it's a lot more work. It's more guilt-ridden or task-driven and Don't neglect the relationship when you open these pages. If we're going to be effective disciples, we must have a deep knowledge of the scriptures, and that comes from getting in God's word on a regular basis. Secondly, we have to continually be growing in our faith. Continually. Look at Apollos. He was still growing in his faith. And Aquila and Priscilla pull him aside and teach him, and he receives it. I'm sure he examines it to make sure that these things are in alignment with the Scripture, but he receives it and continues to grow. Make sure, Christians, that your glory days are not behind you. Don't think to the past when you think of the great times when God was working in your life. Those times need to also be now and in the future. We're not retired from the ministry. We're not retired from the great commission. We continue to press forward and walk closely with the Lord. We must continually be growing in our faith. So we have to have a knowledge of the scriptures and constantly growing, constantly growing. And finally, the third, the third thing that I noticed about Apollos is that he pointed to Jesus passionately. Passionately. Persuasively. I can tell you that the most influential Christians I have ever met in my life are those whose lives point to Jesus with passion. 
there is a genuine love and brokenness. Man, when you start to talk about Jesus, you can just see that their demeanor changes. Something is different about them. They have a love and appreciation for Christ that it's magnetic. You, you, you spend time with these people and you think, that's what I want my heart to be like. That's what I want my relationship to be like. And God wants that for you. So let me tell you that as your knowledge of the scriptures grow in, in the right frame of reference, with the right perspective, with the right motivation to know God more deeply, and as you continue to grow in your faith, it becomes more and more easy to proclaim Jesus passionately rather than out of duty. Religion is walking through all the to-dos out of a sense of duty, and it doesn't impress God. If we got our spouses flowers every Monday because we wrote that on a list and that's what we were supposed to do every Monday, here's your flowers, here's your flowers, at some point they're gonna look at that and say, what is going on here? This isn't very meaningful, it's just on your to-do list. But if you do some of these things because you love them and it's communicated that way, it's the same thing with God. We need to make sure we're, we're walking with God relationally and not out of some to-do list religiously. So I think this, this challenge that we have from Apollos can be such a healthy one, and I don't want to belabor the point, but, but let, me just, let me just simply say, when it comes to applying what we learned tonight, listen, I can, I can give you the read the Bible in a year plan. That's fine. If that's the way that you want to dive into this, as long as you, when you open up the word, you say, God, this is our time. You and I are meeting together. Go for it. I think that's a wonderful thing to do. I can tell you, just pick a book and read one chapter a day and dive into it deeply. But just start it telling God you're doing this together. I, I don't care what this looks like. You determine it. Be creative. What works for you? Pick a time, dive into it, and make it relational. Seek God relationally in his word. Be a person of the word of God. You make the adjustment. Some of you, you're rocking this one. You're doing really well. Awesome. Be encouraged. Continue to grow. Share Jesus passionately. Stay at it. But I would contest that the bulk of God's church in the West is failing in this one. And we just need to examine our hearts and say, how could I be doing this one better? How can, I, how can I approach this in the right heart so that I receive the maximum blessing on my end and that I bless God as I pursue him? I think as, as we seek God in the scriptures, the, the final thing that we put into place, my final piece of advice is simply obey whatever God gives you each time you meet with him. Be ready to hear from him. Keep reading until you do hear from him, and then obey it. And, and I would argue that this is what faith is. Faith is obeying all the commands of Jesus in every situation, in every circumstances, no matter the consequences, no matter what it costs you. Again, just, just think Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That was faith. That was saying, I know this is what's right and I know what's wrong. I will not do what's wrong. I'll follow God no matter the cost. They were willing to die in their obedience. Well, that's faith. That's living out your faith. And we need that now. We're in a culture that is really coming down hard on the values and principles of the kingdom of God. But we need to be people of faith who stand firm, who proclaim in love but not as cowards what we believe, what we know to be true and be representatives of the kingdom of God. And yes, I understand that's going to cost some of us dearly. Live a life of faith. Pursue God anyway. Don't back down. Be courageous. Don't be afraid. We need to take note of how Apollos was using his gifts to build the kingdom of God, and we need to do so ourselves. Let, would you bow your heads? So, Father, I just want to take a moment now with my church family as we think about what we've heard from your word, because, again, it is a reflection of your heart. Perhaps if we could take anything from today, God, it would be that you desire your people to seek you 
in your word. So we hear that and we understand that, God. And if we have been neglecting you in this area of our lives, we know that you have not brought this to our attention to condemn us. You have brought this to our attention to bless us. So we respond to that blessing right now. God, we commit to be obedient in this area of our lives that we would become a people who are mighty in the word, who understand the Father's heart deeply because we seek him in the word regularly. God, would you help us to do that? There are so many distractions in the world, but we don't want to miss out on what you have to give us, what you have to say to us. We want to take this journey through life together with you. There are real challenges that we are facing, real struggles. There's real pain, and we want you in the midst of that. So God, we want to hear from you. So help us to become a people who seek you. Teach us how to listen for your voice in the living word. God, I thank you that ultimately you wrapped up that word in human flesh and you sent down your son, Jesus Christ, that he would live before us, that we would better understand your heart. We're so grateful that you sent Jesus to die for us, that he paid the penalty of our sin on the cross. We believe that he was buried after he died on that cross and on the third day, he rose again. He made it possible for us to have access to you that our sins might be forgiven and that we might receive eternal life. You know, I want to ask you tonight before we close this service, do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you have placed all your faith, your entire heart, you have embraced this truth have you asked Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to be your Savior? Have you confessed Him as your Lord? Is Jesus Christ the treasure of your heart? Holy Spirit, search us in this moment. If the Spirit is impressing on you today that you need to respond, you need to bow your knee, you need to confess Jesus as your Lord. Your heart needs to be washed clean of all sin. I want you to know that the Father's heart longs to do this in your life. He loves you so deeply. He is not here tonight to condemn you. Perhaps you think your sin runs far too deep for God to ever forgive you. And I want you to hear from the heart of God you are wrong. You think of your worst moment and that is the moment that Jesus saw so much value in you that he chose to die for you because it was while you were yet a sinner that he died for you, not at your best, at your worst, and he saw great value in you. And he will forgive you. The blood of Jesus extends further beyond the extent of your sin. The grace of God goes further still than our deepest wickedness. God will forgive you, but you must cling to him, cry out to him, and trust him to do this work in your life. If you've not had God, the blood of Jesus cleanse your heart from all unrighteousness, and you've never asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, tonight needs to be that night. And with no one looking around right now but the eyes of the Lord in this place, looking at each one of us, if you're ready to make that decision right now, would you just place your hand up in the air? Pastor, I feel the Lord working in my heart. I need to make this commitment. Anyone in here tonight? Don't be ashamed. You just place your hand up high in the air for me to see. No hands have gone up, church. So I pray as we leave this place tonight, as we conclude our time in the Word, 
that we would receive the truth that God has given to us, that we would be encouraged and excited about what God holds for us as we put this into practice. Father, we receive your love. We receive your instruction. May we be found obedient as we start this next new week. We're going to spend it seeking your heart in the word that you have given to us. What a blessing. Father, we confess our love for you. Thank you for this wonderful church family. Thank you for our Savior and our King and our Lord, Jesus Christ. We pray this in his name.